Good afternoon. Um, I'm Carol Christ. I'm the, um, the erstwhile director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education and currently the interim um, executive vice chancellor and provost. And I am so pleased that Carol Yu and Lonnie Hancock have been able to join us today. We originally uh, planned this, um, this program for last winter, and then we had a labor action which made it impossible for them to cross the picket line and come to campus. So I'm so delighted we have this opportunity to do this now. I'm going to say a few words about both Carol and Lonnie, though I think um, you're they're familiar probably to both of you. Uh, Carol Yu was elected to the California State Senate in 2008 and re-elected in 2012 to represent the newly drawn 25th district, which is, um, and she represented the 44th assembly district from 2000 to 2006. Uh, prior to her election to the state assembly, Carol served eight years as a La Cunada Flintridge City Council member, including two terms as mayor. She was born in Berkeley. Uh, she was raised in Oakland. She graduated from San Jose State, earning a lifetime teaching credential and an administrative credential from UC Berkeley, and spent 17 years working in the public schools. She has written many key uh, pieces of legislation, um, and uh, they include bills to improve community college student success, provide access to adult education, protect foster and homeless youth, prevent domestic violence, reduce poverty and homelessness, and facilitate alternative custody, rehabilitation, and reentry programs for the incarcerated. Her highest priorities are improving the public education system and assuring essential services for the elderly, disadvantaged, and disabled. She's committed to breaking the cycles of poverty and crime and believes that access to quality education is the key. And she's also working on initiatives on environmental quality and transportation. She chairs the Senate Education Committee and the Senate Select Committee on Aging and Long-Term Care and she serves on the Elections and Constitutional Amendments Committee, Human Services, Insurance, and Public Safety. Um, so that sounds like a lot of committees to me. Senator Hancock has spent more than four decades as a forceful advocate for open government, educational reform, environmental protection, economic development, and social justice. Prior to her election to the California State Senate in 2008, she served three terms in the California State Assembly, and she was the first woman, I remember this well, as elected mayor of the city of Berkeley. Um, and she's also executive director of the Shallon Foundation and has served in both the Carter and Clinton administrations. She represents the 9th State Senate District. That's our district, so we're very proud to have her here. And these, she chairs the Senate Public Safety Committee, the Budget Subcommittee Number 5 on Corrections, Public Safety, and the Judiciary. And she serves on the Education Human Services Budget and Fiscal Review Elections and Constitutional Amendment Committees. It sounds like you, they do a lot of committee service in the Senate. Um, she spent much of her career developing public policies that support and improve um, uh, the public. As head of the Western Regional Office of the U.S. Department of Education during the Clinton administration, she launched after-school early, early reading preparation, college preparedness, and other initiatives. And she helped schools in California obtain millions of dollars. So I'm so pleased that they're both with us today. And I'm going to ask questions for about 40 minutes, and then I'm going to throw it open to you to ask questions. So I'm going to begin with this question. When I joined the university as a faculty member in 1970, tuition, which was then called the educational fee, was actually the first time it was ever charged was 1970, and it was set at $150. Now it's $13,510, which is about 13 times the rate of inflation. Clearly, there, there, there's a wonderful book um, uh, called Lesson Plan, which talks about the three-way partnership in financing higher education. It's always um, a partnership in state institutions between the state and the federal governments, between what individual families or individual students pay and philanthropy. But clearly, this 
has shifted the, 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 the assumption about who should pay in this compact. And I, I wonder if you could talk about your philosophy about that relationship between state support and individual support of students and their families. Well, I can try to get started on that. I'd also like to note, I don't know if people noticed, Carol sits on my committee on public safety. I sit on her committee on education. <laughs> so we have been partners in trying to really look at opportunity for people and how we can work together. And, and but, we also sit together on human services that's right, and uh, elections. So, <laughs> so of the five committees, uh, we are joined at the hip. And she's my seatmate in yes. the Senate. <laughs> and we're friends. And we're friends. <laughs> we still like each other. <laughs> so, it's like, oh. Right. Full disclosure. <laughs> yes. Yes. But, um, Carol, in your original question, you said, well, how have the assumptions changed since 1970? And in thinking it over, I think more to the point is, how has the world changed and what has happened? Because, of course, 1970 was seven years before Proposition 13. Now, Proposition 13 essentially knocked what had been the underpinnings of state budgeting uh, completely off their foundation. Uh, and in the in prior to Prop 13, K-12 education was essentially a local function. After Prop 13, cities were on the verge of going bankrupt. There may be some of you there that can remember. They literally did not have the money to function. Schools were slashing their budgets. And the state of California decided to step in and subsidize those activities that had formerly been done by local government. So whereas K-12 was a local responsibility, I believe the state now pays about 80% of the cost of K-12 education. So big shift in responsibility and ability to pay because in the early 80s, um, Ronald Reagan became our governor and taxes became an anathema. And the tax revolt, which had started really with Prop 13 went spread back across the country and everybody considered taxes a burden as opposed to the dues we pay for a civilized society or as opposed to what I like to call the way we pool our money to buy together what we can't afford to buy as individuals. Okay, fast forward to the 2000s. You had the energy crisis, and in 2008, you had the economic meltdown in the country. Uh, my first year in the state legislature, there was a $30 billion deficit in about a $110 billion general fund. We've tried to cut a billion, even a billion dollars out of a budget. Carol's trying to cut $152 million out of the, cal the budget you here. You cannot imagine how many people have to go and how many functions have to go. And I believe that that is what happened here. And the question is, how do we rebuild? We have not re rebuilt our human services. We have not rebuilt K-12 education. And our university system is really suffering. What can we do about it? We can discuss this more. In the, but my view is go back to the future. 1960, California passed a master plan for higher education. Top 12% would go to a UC. Top 35% would go to a CSU. And every single person would have a crack at community college. Uh, since then, our population has doubled. Our number more than doubled. More than doubled. <laughs> and our number of UCs has stayed pretty much the same, except for Merced in the last 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. And we need to think about who we are as a people and bring back, I think, that very good blueprint. So if I could ask a follow-up question, 
Is there any, you talked about back to the future, is there any way of reversing, I mean, if there isn't enough of a tax base in terms of public policy, it's hard to get back to the future. And is there, how do, how do you see, if you're in favor of increasing the tax base, how do you see that happening? I, you know, for, for me, it's, it's a, this is a very difficult conversation uh, to have when the populace population out there is not willing to or unable to um, put more money into the pot. And so it's, it's a reordering of our priorities. It really is a reordering of our priorities. When, because most of the budget, the state budget, is taken up by um, Prop 98, our public school system. It's, uh, they went to the ballot and we all agreed that um, we shouldn't punish our young people. So K, uh, K-14 is sacrosanct. It's over 50% of the budget. Everything else, human services, transportation, it, um, our, our um, jail system, our, our prison system, uh, higher ed, is all up for grabs. And it really is not even those things. I mean, it's really just higher ed versus the prison system. And it's about, you know, 9 to 11 percent of the total budget. And so um, the benefit of having someone like Lonnie and I, because we can fight the system a little bit together. Uh, I made a promise to myself, you know, that um, the low-hanging fruit in the prison system were the women's prisons. And there were four of them. And I wanted to close four. Well, we got one closed. So we have three more to go, and that's for another, another um, someone else to do. Because there's different ways to incarcerate. And so what we have been doing, in, in our, you know, in, during our time here, Lonnie's been terrific. She um, encouraged us to go to Portugal to look at their drug policy, where drugs are um, not a criminal activity, but a health problem. It's a difference when you spend the money differently. Mm -hmm. We were in um, the Scandinavian countries, went to a high security prison at Halden, called Halden outside of Oslo uh, in Norway, and you'd be amazed going to that prison high security prison, 25 foot concrete wall around this place. I don't remember um, barbed wire or watchtowers, but the guards don't carry guns. Hmm. The only people in uniform are the guards. The prisoners wear street clothes. Jail cells have their individual. Each has a bathroom, bedroom, a little desk, a window that looks outside, Sounds like a dorm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, like what it is. The guards, the guards yeah. take two years to become a guard, and it's uh, it's a totally rehabilitation. They don't want to see you back here. Give you two years to straighten yourself out, and what what you lose is your freedom. But even that's quantifiable because they they encourage um, connection with your family. And uh, so there's a little house that you can you know have an appointment with and, and you have conjugal visits and bring the kids there and there's a full-size kitchen with big knives and you can barbecue and just like on the outside but it's not so um, staying with the subject of right. tuition for another question <laughs> um, one of the most Sorry. difficult aspects of the way in which tuition is set currently is its unpredictability we go now it's been six years with a tuition freeze and then all of a sudden there, there are these big jumps it makes it very hard for the university to budget and it makes it hard for families to plan is there a way you think that we could agree on some predictable um, uh, formula for tuition increases pegged to, let's say, the rate of inflation or something like that, so everybody could plan better? I would think that would be perfectly reasonable. Um, <laughs> in fact, we, we did carry a piece of legislation like that when I was in the lower house. Actually, the UCs opposed it. Um, they didn't want anything that was gradual, predictable, or affordable. They wanted to do. They wanted to. Do, they wanted to do it on their own. Don't let the legislature tell you how to do this. They wanted to do it on their own. So the 
legislature, I mean, I'm sure if somebody carried that bill again, it would go through. Mm -hmm. But if the segments are opposed to it, the governor may not sign it. And that's what happened maybe eight years ago, 12 years ago now. So it really should be a conversation that the UC branches, college, you know, universities have together. Because at the time it was very much, we're autonomous, you don't tell us what to do. And, and the UCs are constitutionally exempt from any uh, regulations by, by the legislature. All we can do is say that we recommend or suggest. And, and, um, the, budget, and the budget is, the, is the, how we tweak yeah. the university system. Yes, when we can. I, I just, um, suddenly it occurred to me, listening to this discussion of, OK, where is their money? How, what, how would you organize a tax base for the university, which has huge needs, I agree. I, I just want to point out that Senator Holly Mitchell and I have co-authored for two years uh, a bill called State Constitutional Amendment Number 5. It would modify Proposition 13 um, by removing the unintended consequence that commercial industrial property is virtually never reassessed. The Chevron oil refinery, for example, has not changed hands since 1977. It has not been reassessed. Um, many other businesses are like that. The result has been that homeowner, it, in 1970, when Carol came, um, it was roughly 50% of the property tax base was residential and 50% was commercial industrial. Um, now it is completely skewed to something like 75% residential and, and much less uh, from industrial properties. So simply calling for the periodic reassessment of commercial industrial property would actually bring in about $6 billion a year, which is quite a lot of money regularly. The good thing about the property tax is it's a regular, uh, fairly predictable, stable funding source. Um, and uh, what if we, uh, I'm you know termed out of the legislature this year, but I'm assuming Senator Mitchell will carry on and look for other co-authors. Mm -hmm. What if the university came in and said, we want to pass a periodic reassessment of commercial industrial property with the money going to higher education, to our university system, rebuild it, get oh. more branches of the university, <laughs> um, pay for better uh, you know, equipment and all the capital needs. Um, we could do that for quite a few years, I think, to That's meet our needs. That's a very interesting mm -hmm. idea. So I want to ask a few questions about the system, the, uh, um, the California sure. state system. I was, there was a report from the League of Women Voters on higher education that was published this year that um, had the rather startling statistic to me, though Saul Geyser, who's in the audience, was it was his and Dick Atkinson's paper that this came from, that California is number 50 among the 50 states in the proportion of places in uh, four-year institutions in relationship to the size of the population. Everything points to an intense enrollment pressure that will be growing at the, um, particularly at the CSUs and the UCs. Mm -hmm. And um, yet there, you know, we've been talking about the, the you know, state um, budget. Um, there doesn't seem to be appetite or, um, or resources for building new campuses. How do you think we can meet this um, enrollment demand that uh, is sure to grow in the, in the decades to come? There, there really isn't a, one, we have to get over this current administration um, and then um, state the case of the need. There is not a CPAC anymore. Um, so all of the segments, I'm mean, talking about the CSU, UCs, and community colleges are all kind of out there by themselves, uh, hopefully not fighting one another. Um, but there needs to be a coming together 
to uh, really demand and work toward fulfilling the needs of our young people because there's a great, because you should say there is a great demand for higher education and yet not enough facilities or not enough investment in, in, into the, uh, what's already going on. So I don't see an opportunity right now. Um, we have not passed, for instance, a bond for higher ed since 2006. And uh, it's because the legislature and the governor can't get themselves together uh, to put something on the ballot. What's on the ballot today, and I'll just, Lonnie and I both feel the same way about it, is a K-12, K-14 bond uh, on the ballot that both of us oppose. And not because we oppose schools, we just oppose the way that it was written. It was written without any input from the legislature or the governor. And so what you have is, um, cash and the building folks putting something on the ballot for the rest of you to vote on, and the state assumes the, risk, the uh, debt burden of um, this without any kind of changes going on, which we sought uh, in a new bond issue. And uh, just for the record, uh, you know, this is the first time I've ever voted no on a, a school bond, but, but uh, until we get our ducks in a row, because we don't want to overburden the state in terms of our debt payment, um, because it just means you can't spend more money elsewhere, uh, and to get some reforms that we think are necessary uh, in and how we give out bonds and put some priorities on who should be getting the bonds. Um, there just needs to be a better discussion about this. I, I totally agree. and. Melissa Mail, who's on my staff in the district office, knows that this is I'm sending this out as part of my recommendations to my constituents on all the state bonds. But Carol, you might have mentioned that we, the two of us, sit on the state allocation board that gives out the K-12 school bond money. It is a system that is over-bureaucratized. It is difficult for schools to use. It made building green schools or earthquaking existing schools next to impossible. And this is a perpetuation of that bond. The legislature was working on a bond that would be leaner, greener, <laughs> more effective. And if this bond should not pass, there'll be another bond in right. a couple of years. And I think it'll be a better a better bond. Um, uh, so there, there is that. But I was just thinking, we started talking about this question of what do you do um, in a situation where there is not immediate more money right. to build or subsidize the university. And you know, I just keep coming back to either we're going to have a cultural shift back to an understanding of the need to pool our money to buy together the things we can't afford to buy as individuals. Or we were talking about we need to relook at education. What, what do we want out of higher ed? Car Carol was just in Japan, where after sixth grade, you're kind of on your own. You can go to trade school. You can compete for the university. Um, what's the value of a university education? Um, we could just keep tacking on more and more students in our big campuses, our existing campuses. At what point do we become diploma mills, just doing, not having face-to-face -face learning, but having kids doing online courses if they can't enroll in the courses that they need to graduate? What's the value of that look in the eye from an instructor that inspires you? I think we need more campuses, but we're going to have to really look hard at who we are and where we want to go uh, with these systems. And there are no easy answers. Uh, Carol, you mentioned CPAC, and I had a question specifically about CPAC. I, one of the really frustrating things to those of us, and I'm thinking of myself more in my Center for Higher Education hat than, than my um, uh, Executive Vice Chancellor hat, one of the really frustrating things right now is that there is no single 
data source for data about the community colleges, the CSUs, and the UC system. So it makes it very, very hard to study anything about the effectiveness of the systems or their interrelationship. The, the genius of the California system is the master plan, and yet this is really crippling a kind of master plan type questions because there's no place we can go for data that, um, for example, studies um, what is most effective in terms of transfer policies from the community colleges to the CSUs and the UCs. So I would I like your thoughts about. Well, I mean, it's it's very apparent, you know, I, just like bond issue, this issue uh, for higher ed is going to have to wait for another governor. Uh, this governor will not support a CPAC. It's still in the books, but there's no money, so it doesn't exist. Um, it's just, I don't know, uh, for whatever reasons, he doesn't like data collection and uh, doesn't think we need it, and uh, it's very difficult to understand from my point of view. Because you carried a bill. Because I <laughs> carried a couple yeah, of bills right. several <laughs> years in a row, yeah. and uh, we just gave up this last year, decided, well, he just would another veto. So. Um, the more interesting thing, though, for me is that he passed, he signed a piece of legislation that allows these segments to um, state goals, state their goals on a, on, a, on a macro level. And so I don't know where those those things are in the Netherlands, I guess, because nobody's, you know, I, I, maybe the Department of Finance is collecting them because we don't know who's doing, who's doing it. But he signed the piece of legislation. It's just curious. Thank you. I have a, a question about community colleges. Um, there is, obviously, the master plan puts enormous emphasis on the uh, universal access to community colleges, and the community colleges is the conduit to four-year institutions. It's built on the transfer function. Yet, lots of research has shown that if you match students equally, um, the student who starts at a four-year institution has a significantly higher chance of graduation than the student who um, uh, goes to a community college intending to transfer and then often does not transfer. And so I, I, the community colleges are a leaky pipeline to a four-year degree. And do you have either of you ideas about how one might make this a better um, conduit to four-year degrees? Well, we've, we're, we've tried, and uh, we've promoted a program called Student Success. And actually, for the past a couple of years, the state has put $800 million more into the community colleges to make sure that kids who enter the system um, get counselors, get tested, get placed, uh, get a program, a pathway to get through in two years, because I think the uh, PPIC came out with a study maybe five years ago now that stated that we needed to have a million more college-educated folks, et cetera, and that if you're going to community colleges, that uh, it's about a seven-year Seven year walk around uh, in our community colleges. There was no two year degrees, there was nothing, no certificates, no uh, transferring, et cetera. Kids were just kind of wandering through. So, we, um, when Jack Scott was uh, chancellor of the system, we uh, instituted, uh, I got a bill passed, student success, et cetera, and they came up, the group came up with 22 recommendations, of which we are in the process of now funding. So, um, of the, th of the three segments, the UCs are the most successful, of course, but you have the, you have the highest um, uh, ability kids coming here um, who are getting out in a, four years, maybe five years, not six years, I hope. Um, and the CSUs are uh, now putting pressure on themselves to get kids out in five years. Uh, I remember as a, as a higher ed chair in the assembly, um, Dave Spence, one of the chancellors, came and, and central office chancellor, and he came and said, "Well, our kids are getting out in six years." I said, "What happened to the four-year plan?" And he was very proud of the six-year plan. I said, "This is, this is costing us all too much money, and, and um, there are not enough resources for this." So, so they are too coming, trying to uh, accelerate uh, graduation rates at the CSUs. But in essence, uh, those kids who transfer here, the UCs, 
if they transfer, they get out in two years. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully the majority of them are getting out in four years, um, entering as freshmen. Yes, yes, there are. So you already talked a little bit about capital funding, but I want to talk more about capital funding, because when I think, I mean, obviously Berkeley at this moment in time has enormous problems, um, challenges with its operational budget. Yet I, as I reflect on the situation, I think the capital budget is even more of a challenge. Um, we currently house um, only our freshmen, no, no students beyond the first year, or very few students beyond the first year. We uh, have um, uh, uh, an old campus, a seismically challenged campus, a historic campus where you can't rip down buildings and start anew. And, um, and as you mentioned, there hasn't been a state bond issue since 2006. So where, 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 where do you see the capital budget? Um, how do you see repairing that? I sound like a broken record. You're just going to have to wait to another governor. <laughs> he will not go forward. He does, his thing is debt. His thing is he doesn't want the state to go into debt. And he doesn't want to partner with you or the CSUs for capital improvements. He wants you to do it on your own. After all, you big university, lots of prestige, you can raise a lot of money. But you could but you've start always, planning now, You could too. start planning now. Because too. this governor has the last two years of his allotted two terms as governor this round, and start thinking about asking the candidates for governor where they stand. Right. And I've always felt that there's probably nothing the alumni of the University of California can't do if they are mobilized and organized. I've never been able to actually see it happen, quite frankly. And um, my view, you got to they need to care and be organized and speak with one voice across all the campuses and reach out to the people they know. <laughs> and um, they need to build coalitions with other groups because in the end, it isn't gonna be just higher ed. I mean, as we've both been lobbied every year by people from the university wanting more money. And it tends to be, we're the university, we're your economic engine. You need to recognize us and give us more money. Well, back when we were 30 billion, 10 billion in the hole, and we, ha we were talking about what to cut, it, it was hard to get realization of that. And I can remember sort of yelling at one, <laughs> I'm sure, well-meaning dean, um, okay, what do you want? You want to cut medical care for poor kids? You want to cut <laughs> people's food? You want to, what do you want to cut? Um, and if you don't want to cut, you've got to get a coalition to turn around a culture that says we don't want to pay taxes. Right. We don't want to pool our money. We don't want to do that. Um, because that is what it's going to take. And the university, with all its economists and Nobel Prize winners and everything, should be, I think, out in front, leading us to that better place. Carol. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hardly an economist or a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> So what is, we, when we first talked about having this conversation, this public conversation, um, we talked about, you know, I know you both care a great deal about higher education. You've lobbied for it. You are friends of the university. Um, what, and yet the, the University of California, as opposed to the other segments, is constitutionally autonomous. What is, if you care about higher education, and I know you both have a lot of ideas, many of which I agree with, um, what's the best way as a legislature you can affect higher education? Uh, I guess I should say the University of California. You do have, um, I, I think there are more members today that are graduates of the UC system than I have seen um, in past years. And uh, they may not be as passionate, but they certainly need to be talked to, convinced, um, maybe encouraged to gather themselves together 
to uh, fight for a better budget for higher education. Um, it is, <laughs> I hate to sound like a record, but you know, you, you are the engine um, that makes this economy, and it needs to um, function better than it has. I, I do think this next, the current class, is, who, which has just had two years under their belt, um, and they have 10 more years to go, I think uh, it would be an opportune time to really take a look at who the legislators are and um, mobilize them and use them as your friends. And don't just, you know, it's not just popping in once a year and making your annual, uh, you know, coffee thing. It's really engaging them, and, and it's hard. I know it's very difficult, but, but uh, engaging them in what is going on on various campuses and, and stuff like that. Become part of their lives. Um, because I think that they, in the end run, they, would, they are good people and they would be committed to it. And you do have the legislators in the Bay Area, I think there are quite a few of them, uh, who, are, who either went to Berkeley or uh, UCLA or you know, neighboring campuses. And you know, even the ones that aren't, people are really committed to the diversity that's at yes. the university now. Mm -hmm. And I, obviously, the university is an economic engine of immense importance to the state. But it's also our social glue. Mm -hmm. It is one of the places where everybody comes together in the state. And um, very, very important for that reason. So I think actually tar really trying to work with the UC alumni and get them to put out um, a budget request or legislation as a group, all of them co-author it. That would have um, a lot more impact, I think. Um, and a lot of it is you need to do some of the organizing work for that. As you could tell from our introductions, we're on five committees or more, each legislator. Carol and I served on the SAB, giving out the state bond money. So you were going from place to place to place almost all the time. Um, come and, and help work with us to work with our colleagues around mobilizing on these issues. Like one of Carol's questions that you haven't gotten to yet is yeah. about overlapping redundant reports that uh, we're, that are often required of higher education. What, what to do about that? Well, I was thinking, bring us a bill. Right. It's hard for lunch. us to figure out what should be in it, right. but you guys bring us a bill. That's the kind of thing that doesn't cost much. We could run with that one. Mm -hmm. But bring us, um, bring us a coalition. Bring us the, the legislation. You'll find people very, very concerned about the future of the university and realize to what extent that really is the future of California. So, Thank you. So now it's time to open um, this uh, discussion up to your questions. Oh. Yes, Yvette. So given the, uh, <laughs> given the state disinvestment in the University of California and what a small percentage of our overall budget state money is now, I'm curious about your opinions on how legitimate it is that state government still has as much control over the university as it does. Our regents are all political appointees of the governor. The legislature controls you know, our tuition, enrollment, other policies. They make us do all these activities, jump through a lot of hoops. How legit is that now? Well, I could just say about that, Carol and I are often the only people that vote against <laughs> some of these bills that come up to try to hold the university accountable on the grounds that you don't fund them, you really ought not to try to run them. And, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's sort of symptomatic of people pointing fingers at each other as opposed to figuring out how to climb out of the, <laughs> the hole we're in. But I, I can appreciate how annoying it must be. <laughs> All right, I would agree, you know, but I don't have an answer to that. It's just, um, 
I just, I, just pointing, piggybacking on what Lonnie said, you just need to be, it's not so much, I know Steve's in the audience, and when he was in Sacramento, he, you know, he, he would host us at his home, et cetera. But it needs to be more than just, you know, dropping in because we are so, quote, busy and all this kind of stuff. It, it really is a relationship uh, that is developed over time. And understanding the needs of the university, not that everything is just always wonderful, you know. I mean, I was shocked to hear that, you know, you guys are $150 million, you know, uh, in a hole here. But um, it needs to be a constant story, not just a panic kind of thing, you know. We need to be involved in a constant manner, and it needs to be a constant conversation. Um, and I think with the, as I said earlier, with the legislature now having longer terms, you, you can afford to develop those relationships over a longer period of time. And I think it will help the university in the long run. Yes. Um, so my question is going to continue the same discussion because this is like fascinating, the whole like trade-off with the budgets and the whole problem with alliance building. And I have a naive question, so <laughs> please bear with me. Like five years ago, I think there was a kind of a mobilization on the part of the students and some interested labor unions around tuition freeze that we are discussing today, right? And I wonder like why that sort of mobilizations you think couldn't turn into something much more organic or long-term? Because there seems to be like a potential of mobilization and putting pressure on the legislature in the first place, but I don't know why it couldn't turn into a much more durable alliance later on. Well, see, I, I would say that is another thing that I would talk to the Alumni Association about. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to remember which alliance you were talking about. If it's one that I'm remembering that was quite effective, it, it was one where students were doing the relay around the building, um, around the Capitol. I even proved to myself at my advanced years I could still do it. <laughs> but they were great. They, I mean, it, it was a very visual kind of thing that happened. And as I remember, it was kind of the brainchild of one graduate student at the ASUC. <laughs> and her leadership kind of put that all together, and we got quite a bit of momentum that year. But you know, just like we've had term limits in the legislature, so up until just now, we've only had a, six years if you were an assembly member, eight years if you were a senator. Um, Students are only here for four or so. And how do you get the institutional uh, foundation so that when somebody starts something really good and then graduates, there's other people to pick it up? And that would be a question for the ASUC and all the ASUCs, I think. And then, again, the alumni. Alumni are all over the state of California. Every single solitary legislator has alumni from the UCs in their district. And if those people were mobilized and focused on the guy that they elect, or the woman that they elect, um, I think it would be a very powerful long-term thing. More questions? Yeah, Mike. Um, the governor has sort of shown that he feels like higher, educa higher education in California should be sort of populist and that the UC, um, it's, it's, if it's just a, a very good university and not an excellent university, that would be okay with him. And I'm just curious if you think that there are any strong defenses of the idea of having an elite public institution that does compete with Harvard and Stanford if there's any th way to argue for that, that will resonate uh, with him or more broadly just uh, at the sort of state political level. I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't know what resonates with him. 
I mean, he's very friendly. He's a little bit more outgoing than he was um, even, even his first term. He's more relaxed today. Um, but he keeps his cards very close to his vest, and uh, he's hard to read. I, don't, I just don't think he's predictable, and he, I think he likes it that way. And so um, I don't, can't think of an argument to him that would uh, influence him to feel stronger about the UCs than any other segment, even though he was a student here. That's pretty interesting. Um, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, you know, I don't know. I don't either. I, I guess we may all need to ask ourselves, um, do we care <laughs> if we're just a decent state university or one of the greatest universities in the world? I suppose everybody's dream is to be the best. <laughs> and we have had that legacy over time. And it has worked very well for us. It's worked very, very well for us in all ways. So um, I personally would like to see it continue. But where we, I agree with Carol on the particulars of just the present governor. Yeah, but to, to um, go to the other part of Mike's question, what are the arguments you think would resonate um, uh, the best, I can't remember how many UCs are members of the American Association of Universities, six or seven. Um, um, how many UCs are in the top, you know, um, 20 in U.S. News and World Report? This is, you know, it's not just Berkeley. This is an astonishing system. At Berkeley, we see people come in here every week from other countries for the purpose of studying how we did it. And um, so how, what, are the, what are the arguments you think, in your political judgment, would be most moving to the legislature or the public more general, generally, about the value of having such excellent university campuses in California, such an international model? Well, I do think you're having problems. I do think the UCs are having problems with the public also. Um, a perception out there that it is elitist, and uh, you know I'm a taxpayer, and I, my kid can't get in, and he meets the uh, requirement, the you know at the 3.3 level, you know that kind of thing, and all around, and all this kind of stuff, and there are lots of uh, anxiety out there. I mean, you see all of our neighboring universities in, in Nevada and Arizona and Oregon and Washington. They all have UC. I mean, they all have Cal. I mean, they all have California kids. Because uh, there's not any room here, and nobody, you know, so um, not any room at the UC level. And um, they don't want to go to CSUs, perhaps. <laughs> it's a very difficult, um, I, I think it's a thing that we really need to talk to all those parents about the investment that needs to be made, too. I mean, it's just not the alumni, yeah. Yeah, but the, the value of a university, a high-valued university system to the public, and what value is that? Um, and it's really hard, you know, when it comes to your pocketbook. Oh, it doesn't mean I have to pay more, you know, to get what I perceive to be kind of an elusive value if my kid can't go. You know, it's hard. So. Um, but it is a message that I think that we do need to work on um, if, if we indeed do value um, what we offer here at, uh, in California. And I agree with you. You know, it's quite remarkable that all of our, most of our university systems at the UCs uh, have been recognized and, and are outstanding institutions. And they did a very nice article on UC Merced Mm -hmm. uh, a couple, uh, you, the LA um, Times did a couple of weeks ago, maybe this last week, a uh, very nice uh, article. And that, that population will double quicker than anticipated yeah. because new buildings are going up. So somebody is putting money into it. Uh, you know, um, if the state's not, somebody is. And so it just, 
you know, I can't, for me, you know, looking at the, just being mundane about it and looking at the budget, um, the only way I can give another billion dollars to higher ed is take it from Lonnie. Close down. Take it from her prison system. Although the governor has managed to find over $2 billion to build more jails and prisons, yes. as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So there's a way, in, but that gets sold to people based on their fear, right. um, not on their hopes. But I do have to say, I think that you raise a very basic question. What does the society do to protect its, its elite institutions when it isn't taking care of everybody. And that's probably a recipe for no social coherence. You know, uh, people get, a, get along better in good times when nobody's terribly insecure and scared. And that's just another reason why I think it is so important to build coalitions to really get what we need in the state, which almost goes back to when Carol was here in 1970, when we were the golden state, mm -hmm. the place where everybody could come and get what they needed to live a fully realized life. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you, because I am an alumna from here, from UC Berkeley, and also a community college um, student as well. And um, I wanted to ask you, we've kind of mentioned this a couple times in the conversation about taxes and like it's okay to pay taxes because we're using them to, to build a stronger system that supports us, et cetera. Um, like what are we supposed to do to tell people that it's okay? How can we convince them? Um, you know, does this mean like an ad campaign? Does this mean the university showing more what they're doing for the community? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, it's, where did this conversation go wrong about taxes? Mm -hmm. Prop 13, 1978, where, it became such a nasty word, uh, you know. Um, that was a very successful campaign, uh, Prop, Prop 13, and nobody expected it to win, least of all the current governor. Um, but that's the dial, that, that's what we've all been facing since that time. So how do you change the conversation around as an investment? Uh, well, into remember this? what we did with our caucus. Yes. We, there, is, there was, it doesn't exist anymore because it didn't get enough funding <laughs> but, uh, from <laughs> philanthropy, but there was a wonderful nonprofit called The Public Works and they did in-depth messaging and focus groups with people about taxes and how they felt about taxes. And one of the things is that government has been talked down and degraded for so long <laughs> that people didn't realize what it does. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize you want your kid to go to a great university and get an education. You want to drive on a road with no potholes. You want to drink the water and breathe the air. Hey, guess who does that for you? It is not um, people making a profit somewhere. And um, they gave us, and you could see in the focus groups how people changed. At the time, I was so taken by it that I actually brought it, the, A the ASUC had a little assembly and we showed this PowerPoint. Um, I'd be happy to do it any time, because I thought that um, I thought that it it was so good in showing um, what a large part of our lives depends on public funding to go well. Um, you know, when the Chevron oil refinery blows up, we suddenly discover that we only have five oil refinery inspectors in the whole state of California. And the country of Great Britain, with the same number of oil refineries, has 100. And then we try to fix it by charging fees and stuff. And we do, sort of. But we, we really need to understand how very dependent we are on working together. Oh, Michael, this is the last question. And we'll have to stop. Well, uh, I'm not sure it deserves to be, but I'll try. <laughs> What's What's the salience among your colleagues in the legislature of two things, and it's a serious question about both, and one is the 
classroom and course experience of undergraduates when they go home on vacation and tell mom and dad about how things were at Cal or UCLA or something. And the second is the record of our Division I uh, athletic teams. Division I credit what? Athletic teams. Athletics. Oh, <laughs> good question. You can do both. How do those things count? <laughs> How do they count in the legislature? In the perception of legislators, yeah, about the university. I don't think they're on the radar screen. Neither? No. I think executive salaries are more on the radar screen. Rightly or wrongly. Hmm. Okay, we have one more question. <laughs> so I'll That's make Michael. it quick. So Bob Berger, now you probably know, has co-led this Lincoln Project, which looked at looks at this problem nationwide, and concludes that it's systemic, and it's not going to the trends are not going to change. So state funding for public universities is way down. It's going to stay down. That's just a fact of life. Now he has, he and his colleagues have recommended other things which may also be completely unrealistic, such major, major federal funding, which I think with a $20 trillion debt, we're not going to get the political support for either. So my quick question is, some of our competitors, Michigan and Ann Arbor, Virginia, have unabashedly said, we're going to privatize a lot. They may not use the term, but basically saying we're going to aggressively go out to get tons of private money to do the great things we want to do. And at least in the last five years, their rankings or whatever have not suffered. But at Berkeley, there's a, a reticence to do that or to embrace that. So is that, do you think, a plausible alternative ultimately for elements of the UC system? Or is that anathema because of the politics in California? You mean about legislators? Or just well, I mean, I think basically it's basically saying the state legislators don't count anymore. You may control us, but you're not going to fund us. So we have to do other things to raise the ninety cents on the dollar that we're spending, since you're only giving us a dime. And that's what Michigan is doing. Michigan and Virginia, I think, are less than ten percent state funded now, and and Berkeley's not much more. Eleven percent. And do you know what the ratios are of, when you say privatization, do you mean like the kind of thing, like the Novartis deal with the College of Agriculture about uh, 10 years right. ago? That's right, it's all kinds of ago? private, private public but partnerships. getting private money is something universities have always done. Right, and, and, uh, and it's been said, and tuition from non-state residents. Oh, right. And from international students, which also was a lightning rod politically. But it's basically saying, we're never going to recover anywhere near the funding we've had. It's yesterday. It's not tomorrow. This well, really I have to, I'm just going to have to say, yeah. I'm a child of Berkeley in the 60s. <laughs> um, nothing is ever a fact of life or impossible. <laughs> Look at what's going on in the world right now. It isn't necessarily good, but certainly the US political system has been shaken up. I think, we, no, we have to turn this around. We do not want to become an arm of corporate America. If that was the question, at least I, I would hope we would not be. I Ms. Think, Lou? I, you know, I, I, would agree, I would agree. I mean, but it, it, is, it is all this changing the conversation around. It's been going on for a generation. It's very difficult, very difficult. It, it, but it means it's a very serious conversation that we should have among more people. So it becomes a bigger thing than just a few of us talking about it. Um, you know, and it's, as you say, it's happening nationwide. It's not just happening here or in Michigan. And it's, it, it warrants a larger conversation. It just does. And so, uh, you know, you can start that, Michael. Yeah, well, it's the such. Tax revolt yeah. started in California in 1977 with Prop 13. We like to hope, many of us, that when we passed the extension of existing taxes four years ago, um, and now it's up on the ballot again, we can show that California is going to start something pushing back across the country that the tax revolt is over and declare a victory, leave the field, or whatever that we have to have the public investment that our 
the people in our country need. Um, and we should, I think we need to try to seriously kickstart that in every organization we're part of. Robert Reich, the chancellor. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's thank Carol and Lonnie for a wonderful discussion. <laughs> <laughs>